inside the minds of the most influential women of Hollywood. Take one. Hi, I'm Madison Mollert, and you're watching Inside the Minds of the Most Influential Women of Hollywood. Today, I'll be interviewing Anne Peacock, who's the writer of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and The First Grader, which is like one of my favorite movies. This is going to be such a fun interview. As a kid and family. How was your day been? Good, thank you. What are you working on right now? I'm working on Hunting Eichmann, which is a, it's a book that I'm adapting, uh, turning it into a movie. Oh, what's that about? It's about uh, the man who was uh, responsible for killing six million Jews during the Second World War. And this story is about the hunt to catch him. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. You grew up in Cape Town, South Africa. Yes. So what was it different from going to school there than it would be in the USA? The schooling in South Africa, I think, is a little different from America. Not that much different, but one thing is everybody wears school uniforms, and I think the schools tend to be a little more formal. Um, uh, the discipline is a little stronger, a little stricter than it is in the United States. But, you know, schools are schools. They, they're not much different, really. So what was your favorite book growing up? I, I read a lot of uh, boys' books. I read war books and... Um, I didn't have a particular favorite, but I also read a lot of Dickens. I liked Great Expectations. Uh, South African children read British literature. They didn't read American stories. Like, I never read Tom Sawyer. or I, I hadn't read any American literature when I was growing up. It was all English stories. You said when you were younger, you thought of being an artist or an actress. Why didn't you? Um because it was really too hard to have a career as an artist or uh, an actress in those days when I was young. And I think my parents had the idea that you needed to have a profession. It wasn't being an artist or an actress wasn't regarded as a great thing to do. Hmm. So um, I went to university and I became a teacher and then I became a lawyer. And only when I came to America did I become a screenwriter. The Biz! You were writing the new Cinderella for Disney Universal. Right, right. Did you enjoy the original movie as a kid? I've never seen it. Hmm. I've never seen a Cinderella movie. And now you're writing the new one? Yeah, well, my version of it is not uh, a very... I, I wouldn't say it's very... You know, the basic story is the same as Cinderella, but... There are no pumpkins, there are no glass slippers. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a little different. Now, I know it's pretty top secret, but could you give me just a tiny bit of information about it? About uh, it is pretty top What's secret, actually, so I can't really say very much, but I can just tell you that my version of Cinderella, she's a real warrior girl, and she's not a little girly waiting for the prince to show up and marry her. So mm -hmm. I think she's a very modern Cinderella. What is the hardest thing about writing a script? Writing a script <laughs> is, uh, there's nothing easy about it. You know, it's hard all the way through. Hmm. Um, I don't think there's anything, uh, any aspect of it that is harder than the rest of it. It just takes a lot of time and a lot of thought. And I suppose you might say perfecting it. You start out and you just, you get through the story and then you go back and you perfect it. That's probably uh, the hardest part. But I remember something and you said that the one thing you can't write is comedy. Why do you think that you can't write comedy? Because I'm really not funny. That's the thing. You have, uh, writing comedy is the most difficult form of writing. And you have people, some people just have a real gift. One of my daughters, who's also a lawyer, is really, really funny. She just can be funny. She's not funny as a person, really, but she can write really funny dialogue. I just can't. I'm um, just not funny. Can so, you write any dramedy? Yeah, well, drama, yes. Uh, mm, that's what I'm good drama, at. Dramedy is a mix between comedy and drama. No, I don't think so. Hmm. Um, I'm, if there's anything funny in a script, they have to get somebody else to put it in. Really? Yeah. Have you ever had that happen? Yes, every writer gets other writers come in and do work. 
on their scripts. It's just and part of being a writer. Because Kit, Kit Ridge is sort of like a funny ish movie. Well, I suppose I never thought of that as a comedy. No, it's not. Yeah, but, you know, and it's, it's light. Yeah, it's I suppose it's light. For example, the Narnia movie. Um, there were two writers who came in and, and really lightened up and put some comedy in it, some humour in it, um, which is good, you know. You, we all have our strengths. Yeah. You write a lot about different places. Do you ever go there for research? Yes, I do. I, um, one of the lovely things about being a screenwriter is you can enter a, a different world. And so, for example, the first grader, I went to Kenya, and which was fabulous and I, you know, it enables you to imagine the world if, if you're not familiar with that world. Yeah. And for a lesson before dying, I went to Louisiana. I had never been to Louisiana. Each place is very different, so I went there. But it's one of the really lovely things about being a writer is uh, going to different places. Even if you only go in your head. Mm. Yeah, like Narnia, you had to. You had to. I went to Narnia in my head. Mm -hmm. What is your advice to someone young who wants to be a screenwriter? I would say they should write and write and write as much as they can. And also read other good screenplays. Read all the scripts that you can lay your hands on. That uh, You know, you can choose movies that you happen to like and get the scripts. You can get them online. Pretty much any script mm -hmm. is there for you to read. And I would do that. I would also get a book on the technique of screenwriting because there's a, there is a technique, as there is with everything. How do you do it, you know, dividing up your acts and all the rest of it. And that's what I would tell them to do. You say that the work you are most proud of is A Lesson Before Dying. Can you tell us about it? And why are you, why are you so proud of it? Well, it's, you know, it was a beautiful book. I, re I fell in love with the book. Mm -hmm. it was, it's just a really wonderful story. And I was able to adapt it without much interference from anyone else. And it was filmed almost directly from the script. I don't know how much you're aware of the way the movie business works, but often you, your script that you hand over, it doesn't quite end up the way you wrote it. Mm -hmm. And A Lesson Before Dying, what was very nice about it was they've barely changed what I wrote. But the, the, and so the movie came out re really, really well, I think. And it brought out the, the best in the book because it's based on a really beautiful book. Well, what is like the story of it, really? What's the story of A Lesson mm -hmm. Before Dying? It's uh, set in the South um, in the 40s. And it's about a um, it's about an African American man who is unjustly accused of murder, uh, and he is condemned to death. And um, it's the story of a, a teacher who was a childhood friend of his, who comes and visits him while he's in jail, and helps him to come to terms with what has happened to him and to accept, simply accept responsibility for his life, even though he's been unjustly accused. In the end, does he? He is, conde he yeah. is executed okay. unjustly. Uh, and the, the, you asked me earlier on about going to places. That was one of the most interesting places I've ever been to, because I went to one of the prison farms in uh, this country. It's a huge prison farm in uh, Louisiana. And uh, I met with men on death row. So it, it was very, very interesting to write that movie. Wow. That's... I saw the electric chair, everything. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I didn't even know they really... I thought electric chairs were... Well, the like electric TV. chair that they had, they actually weren't using anymore, mm -hmm. but it was still there. I think they were using lethal injection when I went there. And they showed us the room where it was done. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. 
It was, was it very like, interesting. Did, was there, did that sort of like give you the chills that you walked in that room? It was. I mean, it, it's awful. I, I personally don't believe in the death penalty. Mm -hmm. So um, it was pretty horrifying. Oh, my God. Yeah. How did you get inspired to write Narnia? Well, the, uh, a producer approached me, actually, and said it was the producer of A Lesson Before Dying. Mm -hmm. uh, that had been so, so successful that he asked me if I was interested in doing Narnia. And so they sent me the book, and I went, flew to New York. That was another trip. <laughs> and met with them there and uh, pitched the story and I got the job. You're almost finished writing your first book, Henry and Lena. That must be exciting. Yeah, well, it's, it's based on a true story. I'm from South Africa yeah. and I don't know how much you know about South Africa, but it's a country where that has a history of racial discrimination mm -hmm. and white and black people were not allowed to marry. Mm -hmm. You would go to jail mm -hmm. if, if you did that. And this is a story about a couple, Henry and Lena. Um, she was white and she was blind and he was black. Actually, he was mixed race. And it, they lived on a farm where my mother grew up. And people knew that they were a mixed race couple, but nobody told on them because if, if the authorities had known, they would have gone to jail. But they had a very beautiful love affair, these two. Yeah, but she didn't know he was black. She never knew he was black. Well, you've stolen the plot of my book. I imagine in the book, uh, the way I've written the book, is that she didn't know until something happened in South Africa. The government sent people around to every house to every person in the country and you had to declare your race. And so in my version of the story, um, that's how she discovers that her husband is not white. And he, they, they then get into trouble because the authorities discover that a white and a not white person are married. And it's the story of the, these two people. Family and charity. How old are your children and can you tell us about them? They're too old to uh, uh, tell you their ages. There's not much point because they're all grown up. But I have five children. And I have one, I have four daughters and one son. Dean. And one daughter lives in London. And she's a um, counseling psychologist. Mm. And then my son lives in Cape Town, South Africa. And he is a gender violence consultant. And I have another daughter who lives in Minnesota, who has uh, babies, twins, and another one. And she trained as a nurse. And then I have another daughter in LA who is a, an attorney, and she has a little baby. And then I have another child who lives in San Francisco. What's it like to be married to a neurosurgeon? Well, it's a very stressful job and it takes up a lot of time. So if you are, um, if your partner is a neurosurgeon, you're not going to see much of them. And my husband, you know, spends a lot of time at the hospital. Um, he's a pediatric neurosurgeon and they deal with children with brain injuries or brain tumors, anything to do with the brain, if it's a ch uh, a child and so um, it's just a very it's a very time-consuming uh, job so it's good if if you're married to someone who has a job like that it's good for you to have uh, something to do. Do you support any charities? I uh, give to Global Giving which is a it's a international uh, organization and you can choose the country, you can choose the cause. Mm -hmm. And the specific cause that I give to is to children of rape victims in the Congo. Mm. Because they are the most, I don't think you could get lower in the world than that. Even their own mothers have rejected them. So they have nothing. And I give money for their support and their schooling. The genie question. If a magic genie came to you and gave you three wishes, 
what would they be? The one wish would be for the world. And I would wish that there'd be no child that was starved or abused. And my second wish would be for this country. And it would be that no child was starved or abused. And my third wish, if it were just for me, not for my children or anybody, just for me, it would be that I can write until I die. You are such an interesting person. Well, thank you. I enjoyed the, uh, answering your questions. Mm -hmm. Very poised young lady. Oh, thank thank you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm Madison Mullers, and you just watched Inside the Minds of the Most Influential Women of Hollywood. Bye!